All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Computer Science uh, 354. This is Machine Organization and Programming, also known as Introduction to Computer Systems. This is our first lecture. This is going to be part one of the first lecture. I'm going to split it up into a couple of pieces, makes it easier to digest. Um, and just uh, as we get started, just a quick overview of what's going on today. We're going to start out with course logistics. We're going to go over the syllabus and the schedule. Then I'm going to dive right into an introduction to how computers work. And then we'll do a little bit of C programming and break down what's going on when we compile programs. So first up, uh, let me start out with an introduction to me. And I'm covering up the slide. One sec. I'll put that off. All right, yeah. So my name is Mike Dosher. Please call me Mike. I got my email address right there. It is all over the Canvas page. If you have any questions at all, feel free to email me. Just a little bit about me. Um, I've got my PhD, but it's in chemistry. I actually went to the University of South Carolina. And uh, after that, I um, moved to the Washington DC and worked at the Naval Research Laboratory doing top secret research for the Navy and Marine Corps there. I uh, built sensors. Uh, I can't tell you more. Uh, when my contract ran out, I, I never enlisted. I wasn't in the Navy. I um, uh, took a job teaching chemistry at Benedictine College in rural Kansas. That was a good experience. I was there for eight years. And then I decided that I was curiosity got the best of me. I really loved computer science. I took some classes online while I was there and decided to go back to school. Came here to UW-Madison, went to uh, got my master's degree a couple years ago. And since then, I've been working at a small startup company, SciArt Software, where we make uh, engineering software that designs parts like you would see over here. It's going to take a part in engineer designs and then help them make it lighter. Um, and up until last week, I was a full-time programmer with that company. Starting today, I'm now a full-time teacher at UW-Madison. Um, yeah, and for the past three years, I've been teaching like just a one-credit class in either C++ or MATLAB. And then during the spring semester, I did uh, Introduction to Data Programming, CS200, uh, 220, my bad, uh, 220. All right, um, I'm going to pause the video and then pull up the syllabus, and I want to just walk through some things. All right, so if you're watching this video, that means you've already found the Canvas page for our class. So uh, a couple of uh, things. Uh, first up. Uh, this is our homepage. It's going to look like this with a whole lot more information as the course goes on. There will always be announcements up here at the top. So the first couple of announcements, please read the syllabus. I'm going to pull that up in a second, highlight just a couple things. Please sign up for Piazza. Um, we'll use that as an online forum for communication. You guys can ask questions there. You can see questions that other students have asked. Please don't post code there. Um, greater than about five lines. Um, uh, we're going to be using the Linux machines in the CSL laboratories. Uh, in order to do that, you'll need to activate your computer science, your CS account, if you haven't already done so. Chances are, if this is uh, not your first class, you've already had to do that. Um, if you're welcome, uh, if you're new to the University of Wisconsin, welcome. Please go click the link, go there, and activate your account. All right. Um, let me just finish going through the schedule page. Uh, first, there's a couple things. We've got two TAs this semester. Um, and they're going to be grading the homework, helping me out with a ton of stuff. And so if your last name begins with the letter A through L for project one, then you'll write to Ian. And if it begins with M through Z, you'll write to Hannah. And we're just going to alternate back and forth uh, so that each of you will have each grader half the time. And so we'll just do this for easy correspondence. So go ahead, send them an email with any questions you guys have about class. If they're unable to respond in a timely manner, then send me an email, copy me on it and uh, we'll make sure that your questions are answered. All right, uh, we're having our meeting later this afternoon to set up uh, office hours. We'll be using uh, Blackboard Collaborate, uh, which is over here on the left side. You'll just click that link during office hours. There'll be a session you can join. I will put together a short video about that also, about just how, how to use it, what it looks like, and some of the problems that we've had uh, and how to get around those. All right, and then here we have just day-by-day -day schedule. So we've got the course intro, C um, programming basics. That's the topic for today. The video, this is the video I'm making right now. So there's no link here yet. And by the end of the day, there'll probably be about five links to different videos because I'm going to break this up. Uh, again, I'm still working on the PowerPoint slides. Make these as I go. I got to admit, I really love the whole online lecture video format because I can 
make up the slides. I can record a few minutes, make the next set of slides, record a few minutes. It's great. Um, we have two textbooks for this course. Uh, they're both on the syllabus, links to there. Please go ahead and uh, start reading chapter one of both of those. And then down here, I've just got the, I don't really like the way that table looks. I'm gonna have to go back and fix this. Um, the week by week schedule of all the topics we'll be covering and special events. Like in week four, we'll have the midterm. During week eight, we'll have the final exam. And please note, there's gonna be about four days worth of videos every week. Uh, this week, they're gonna be coming out on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, so four days per week. And the day that we do not have videos coming up will change week to week, depending on my schedule. All right, let me just click this link and pop over to the syllabus real quick, go over a couple of things. I've got contact information for myself and the TAs. Uh, like I said, office hours will be determined uh, in our meeting this afternoon. I've got the official overview. When you guys signed up, this is what was on the My UW page. Bunch of information about what the course meets. I uh, haven't made any mistakes yet, so that I know of. But anyway, corrections will be appearing right here. Um, you guys, please read the introduction. So lectures are all going to be online videos. You can watch them anytime you want. They'll be available all semester and pretty much forever because you'll have access to this Canvas page. Um, they'll be via the Cultura Media site, which was, uh, let me see, that's over here, right here on the left. You can click that and get to all the videos. Or I'm going to put links to all the videos on the schedule page. You can just click that. But if you found this video, you already know this. All right, so there's the online lecture. Um, I try and make my videos as interactive as possible. My goal is that it, it's a guided learning experience. To be honest, lecture is one of the worst ways to learn how to program com in computer science in general. Video lectures are even worse. It is so easy to just kick back, pop this up on your mobile device, play some Xbox while the videos go on and call it good, right? That is not how I want this to be used. Um, this is gonna be an experience that you'll benefit greatly by just sitting down at a real computer, opening up the video, pausing the video and going and trying the activity that I'm doing. Follow along, do it yourself. Um, today is mostly logistics, but starting with video two, it's a guided learning opportunity. So, and I'll, I'll walk you through exactly how I think you should, guys should use this. And then after you finish uh, watching the video, go ahead and read the reading assignments for the day. Um, we're going to be using two textbooks, Computer Systems, of Programmer's Perspective. This is more about the systems side of things. And then we'll also have the C programming language. I'm um, using the second edition for both of these. This book is a usually abbreviated KNR. Its authors are very famous. Rich D actually was the inventor of the C language. Um, I put uh, these two links actually go to the Amazon page if you're interested in buying a hardcover book. Uh, at this point, um, I highly recommend actually getting an electronic version so you can uh, just copy and paste the code examples in um, and try them yourself. Uh, so just do a quick Google search. Computer Systems, a Programmer's Perspective got me a link to the free copy, free PDF in like the top 10 search results for the um, C programming language. I had to put the author's names in and then I'd scroll down. Within the top 10 search results, there was a free option available there too. Um, if you have trouble finding the book, uh, please send me a message. All right, so we're going to be using um, Canvas as a way to communicate. Everything will be on Canvas. The links to the projects, the links to the videos, the links to readings. Everything's going to be right here. We use Piazza as our online forum. Um, this is the link to sign up if you to get into our class. Um, don't post code here. Um, more than five lines. Uh, and people are going to ask questions here. You can check out questions that other students in the class have asked and check frequently to stay up to date. I've got my notifications set to the two hour. Um, every, every two hours, if someone's posted, I get the little email thing. So I'll try and answer in a timely manner. Um, I'm also going to be using the course list pretty much daily to let you know when the videos are available um, and for other announcements about projects due dates, uh, important stuff, midterms, finals. So uh, you're responsible for all the stuff I send by email to that list. Uh, if you have a question that's not appropriate for Piazza, it's personal or something involves like attaching code, please go ahead. You can email code to your TA. If it's something completely unrelated to like the content of the class, please just come directly to me. And again, there's a who's my TA. This will change uh, for every project. Um, it's going to alternate back and forth. So for projects due, they'll flip. And um, yeah, all right, so how do I pass the class? 
Uh, we're going to do a bunch of projects. I believe we're going I'm, to, I'm currently planning to do six projects. They'll be worth 55% of the grade. Uh, there's going to be a weekly quiz. The, the goal of this quiz is to just make sure people are staying up to date. It's way easy to procrastinate and fall behind. You think, oh, I'll just watch the video later. I'll read it later. There's no rush. The project isn't due till next week. The midterm isn't until week four. So the quizzes are just there as a way to for you guys to test and make sure that you actually really did get what I'm looking for. It does give you a little bit of practice and um, it's a way to just make sure that you're keeping up to date with things. All right, um, we'll have two exams, a midterm and a final, and then one bonus percent for participation. This is gonna be based on like filling out surveys, registering for Piazza, uh, filling out the evaluation for me and my TAs, things like that. Um, and let's see, all right. And I wanted to comment on this too. 95% uh, guarantees you an A, 90% an AB, 85% guarantees you a B. This is probably one of the harsher grading scales at the university for most classes. But the reason it's set like this is because a, a lot of the projects, it's possible to do really well if you just put in enough time. Um, and in fact, in some of the projects, we'll actually just be giving you the answer. Here's the problem, here's the answer. Figure out how you go from problem to answer. So. With that in mind, um, the, the projects uh, make it really hard to decide who has really demonstrated the ability to understand what's going on and, and you know, really did earn that A. Um, so anyway, the, the grading scale is set really quite high. I've never actually used a grading scale this high. I always curve the class and I frequently write things that are too difficult. So. That will be, will be happening, um, and I will keep you guys up to date as to what I estimate the current grading scale to be. So anyway, just before the class starts, I'm just throwing this up there. All right, let's see here. Um, next up, if you require any accommodations to make the class successful for yourself, um, or you participate in any religious holidays that are going to uh, make uh, keeping up with the course uh, troublesome, please just let me know within the first week of class. If you have a visa from the McBurney Center, let me know. And uh, yeah, definitely let me know what I can do to help out for exams or projects. All right, let's see, uh, projects. 55% of the grade. For all of these projects, we're gonna be running um, the code on the Linux uh, operating system. Um, we're gonna see uh, that um, we different configuration um, have trouble like a Windows machine will do something a little different than a Linux machine in order to make grading uniform to make sure all the code works We'll be connecting to the lab machines. I'll demonstrate how to do that in a video sometime in the next 48 hours and Just walk you through the process uh, if you haven't seen it before so um, the projects are hard and they do take a lot of time and with the eight-week uh, summer schedule there's not a lot of days, so it's important to keep up with this. Start on them pretty much as soon as the, they're released. <coughs> and um, all of the assignments are gonna be in the C programming language or x86 assembly. So two awesome learning opportunities. Let's see here, on my late policy. Um, I like to think it's really generous. I'm not sure everyone agrees with me, but here's the idea. It's not late until we start grading things. Uh, all the projects will be due at 11.59 p.m. And we probably won't stay up late to start grading things. I have never done that. Um, so depending on, you know, if you, uh, well, oh, and you can submit the projects as many times as you like. So if the deadline approaches, if it's 11.58 p.m., go ahead, turn in what you've got done so far. And then keep working. And then, you know, if you get a little further, turn in a new version. We'll grade the most recent on-time submission, on-time being before we actually start grading even though there's technically a due date listed on Canvas at 11.59. Um, if we've started grading, then it's late. Um, and you can submit work up to one week late for half credit, um, but work will not, and uh, after that, we will not accept the assignment. And no work will be accepted after the last day of lecture. That'll be on the schedule when we get closer. So yeah, the very last project will not have the, the opportunity to turn in late. All right, uh, we make mistakes all the time. Well, at least I do. Um, after your score has been, after your project has been graded, check out your score. If you think there's a mistake, please first contact the TA who graded it. And then if they're not able to resolve the issue, please send me an instructor. Please send me an email, I'm the instructor. Words in right order, got it. Okay, um, there are some things that may come up 
If it's a configuration issue because you wrote your code, ran it on Windows, and you tell me that it runs great on Windows, but not the machine that we told you to use, um, we're not going to fix that. That's your problem. Um, so please verify that your code actually runs on the Linux machines in the lab before you turn it in. Um, we're also not going to make any small corrections to your code. We're not going to change your code. If it's almost right, if it looks correct, we're still not going to give you the points. Uh, if, if you come back and say, I need a regrade, I made this tiny typo, we're going to work with you, of course. But we're not going to fix it ourselves. All right. Um, randomness. Sometimes things pop up that you don't expect, just uh, random issues uh, that results in your code failing. Sometimes we'll work with you to resolve these also. Obviously, if you cheat, you're going to get a zero on the assignment. Um, we use uh, Moss as our cheating detection mechanism. It's very, very good. So, In fact, um, if you do decide to cheat, I would definitely recommend going ahead and reading those articles about how to defeat Moss. You'll probably actually learn more about programming trying to beat the system than you would uh, actually just doing the assignment. It's definitely easier to just do the assignment than it is to take someone else's work, change it enough that it's going to be uh, beat the system. All right, and then uh, finally, uh, we use a lot of automated tests when we grade the code. And um, it's possible to write code to defeat our tests without actually demonstrating that you've learned the particular skill that we're asking for. If you solve the problem in a different way, or you just straight up write code that just generates the right answer without actually doing the work. I've got an example here. You can read that later. Um, that's also wrong. We're just going to mark it incorrect. We do uh, read your code also, not just use the automated testing. All right, there's uh, how we catch you cheating. Finally, some learning objectives. We're required uh, to turn in all the learning objectives on the syllabus. These last three are about quantitative reasoning because it meets that requirement. Um, okay, yeah, here's the link to activate your CS account. This is also available on the schedule page. And one final note, I put this on my syllabus too uh, with regard to recommendation letters. A lot of times students who have done well in class will ask me for a letter of recommendation for graduate school or an internship. Um, unfortunately, getting an A or doing really well in this class is not enough for me to write a letter that's good enough to get you into graduate school. Um, a lot of people have these did well in class letters, actually abbreviated DWIC. They're pretty common. And the problem is that stuff is already on your transcript. It's just duplicated. And chances are in an online learning environment like this, I will never actually meet you guys unless you come see me next fall. Um, our, all the interaction will be by email, or if you come to office hours, we'll use video there. Um, but you're not actually in class. I don't get to know anybody really well. That's an unfortunate uh, aspect of the online learning. But if you do want me to write a letter, I need to know something interesting about you guys so that I have something to write about other than, yeah, I got an A in class. Um, and a number of questions on graduate school applications ask me about how is your language proficiency? How is your writing? How is the level of your curiosity? How well will you be able to perform research or work as a TA? And those are all questions that I can't answer um, unless I know you well enough. So um, I recommend getting involved in some activities, uh, doing some research on campus if you're looking for uh, at going to graduate school because letters of recommendation will be important. All right, I'm going to pause here and pop back over to the PowerPoint. All right, so just a quick high-level overview of the entire course all at once. The next eight weeks are going to be broken down into three basic sections. The first one is going to be about C programming. The second half of this uh, course is going to be um, more or less focused on assembly programming, very low-level stuff, code that does one instruction at a time. And finally, we'll talk about some system topics. And some examples of those uh, would be things like virtual memory, caching, communication and interrupts, dynamic memory allocation, operating systems. I've got some blanks here. Uh, if you guys have some topics that you'd love to hear me talk about, uh, send me an email. Let me know what you're interested in. Um, take a look at the textbooks. Those back couple of chapters have a lot of stuff that I've got to, I've got to choose some things. And I, I don't have time to do all of it. All right, so there's the course overview. Now let's start digging into today's topic. First, uh, I'm going to spend some time to talk a little bit about how computers work. So um, just the really obvious things. I've got a big box over here on my desk, or I've got a laptop. That's hardware. I'm also running some code. It could be a web browser 
or uh, a code a piece of code that I wrote or a PowerPoint something I've got a program I'm running in between that uh, we have software systems and this is gonna fall into oh yeah here I, I, I made some slides uh, so word processing web browsing C programs PowerPoint things like that would be applications under software systems, this is going to be our operating system. Things that connect an application program that we care about running to the computer hardware so it does stuff. So Windows, Linux, um, also any sort of hardware driver like your graphics card. NVIDIA tells me every single week that it's got a new update for my graphics card. Things like that. That would be a software system. Um, and finally, the hardware. Three major pieces we'll be talking about today are the CPU, the processor, um, the memory, which is also known as RAM, and the hard disk or solid state drive, SSD. All right, so let's take a close look at what happens when we run a program. So here I've got a couple, just three lines out of a much larger C program on, called SUM. All this program is going to do is take two numbers stored in variables and add them together and store that in a third variable. So as we run this code, um, I want to take a look at this from a very specific point of view, the von Neumann architecture. So this is a computer system described many years ago, maybe 1950s, where uh, the model of the computer has a processor, the CPU, that does all of the logic and math operations, and it's got some memory. Those two are connected together, so a place to store the numbers and something that manipulates the numbers. Now, without input and output, this would be pretty worthless. So we're also going to be using input and output as part of uh, the, the model we're looking at. And input and output could possibly be the same device, like a hard drive. I can input data into memory, uh, manipulate it on the CPU from a hard drive, and then I could save the results. Um, but things like monitors, keyboards, mice, uh, uh, internet connection, all those would be inputs or outputs um, from this point of view. Okay, so I want to draw the same picture a little differently now. If you actually like take the cover off your computer and look inside, you can see the memory chips, you can see the process, you can see the giant fan on top of the processor, and you can see your hard drives. So they're all connected, they're just pieces in the computer. So what I want to ask is just take a second and think about this. If I come um, if I write this code, I opened up an editor, I type in all the lines, and then I save it. Where exactly does sum.c, that's my the name of my file, where does that exist? Is it in the processor, the memory, or on the hard drive? All right, so make a commitment, make a decision, put your finger on one of those three boxes, and in three, two, one, I'm gonna click. There it is. It's actually stored on the hard disk. When I write a file and save it, that's gonna go straight to the hard drive. Um, the next thing that we do when we're going to run a program is we need to compile it. So the processor cannot deal with language like this. It can't say A equals 1, B equals 2, and actually understand what's going on. It only reads machine code or binary code, the zeros and ones. So the process of turning this high-level code that's actually readable, hold on, where's my mouse pointer? Pointer options, arrow, visible, there we go. Um, so we can turn this code into something the computer can read. We're going to use a compiler. You guys have likely seen this before if you took Java. Java has a compiler that generates bytecode that then runs on their uh, Java interpreter. Um, and this is just going to be binary at the end of it. In fact, this file, after we're done compiling, is also stored on the hard drive. Oh, that's the next slide. All right, so uh, a couple of definitions. This code over here that I write in my text editor and save is the source code. The compiler that we'll be using is GCC. That's the compiler available on the Linux machines in the lab. That's uh, an abbreviation for GNU C compiler. Um, and GNU actually stands for GNU not Linux, not Unix. Misspoke there. Uh, GNU not Unix. So it's a recursive definition if you think about that a little bit because this GNU also stands for GNU not Unix and keep going forever. So anyway, this is just our C compiler. And this code, the binary code, is known as the executable. It's also called an object file or machine code. I'm going to use all three of those to mean the same thing. OK, now this is the slide I was thinking of, this one right here. So um, the binary code in my sum file is also stored on the hard drive after the compiler is done with it. So check this out. My source code has the .c extension. When I compile it, it's just going to be sum without an extension. 
And in fact, on the Linux, if you list all of the, the um, contents of a directory, it'll have a little star because it's an executable. All right. Uh, in the computer, uh, the motherboard, that really colorful, mine's black, I believe. Uh, they used to all be green. Just circuit board in the background that all of these things attach to have millions of little wires that connect everything together. All right, millions is an exaggeration, but lots of little wires all embedded in that circuit board that connect the processor to the memory to the hard disk. And in fact, if you look at um, typical hard disks, the newest um, flash drives are actually built right into the motherboard. But if you have like a mechanical hard disk, they're going to be off to the side with a probably a SATA cable these days connecting that hard drive to the motherboard. Um, Oh, I, wanna, I don't have a screwdriver right here, otherwise I'd pull this apart and show you guys. All right, uh, so the next thing we're going to do, after we compile the code, uh, I'm looking up the top here. I've got my three arrows. This is the prompt, command prompt. When we run a uh, computer program on a Linux machine, we need the dot slash that tells me to use the program in the current directory, just in case I have more than one program called sum out there. And then I need the name of the, the program I'm running. So the first thing that happens when we start running this code is the operating system is actually going to run another piece of code, a program called the loader. And that's going to take this machine code and actually store it in memory on the RAM chips. <clears throat> and it's going to be divided into two sections. There's going to be a code section. So in this case, um, I'm just looking, I just copied one line here. This is the part that's actually going to do something. So C is equal to A plus B. It's going to go in code. And we'll also have a data section where we're going to store all of the variables and the contents of those um, variables. <clears throat> okay. So, all right. Uh, the loader is a program that the CPU runs that just moves data from the hard disk to the memory. So it's ready to go. All right. If we take a little, little deeper look at the processor, we're going to find that it also has some locations for memory. There's really only like 10 of these on a typical uh, computer processor. Uh, and the one I've drawn here only has three. So these registers are locations where we can store numbers. Um, so the next thing that happens as we look at this, I've got A is equal to one. We're going to copy that. Okay, let me, let me rewind a little bit. When I'm looking at only this line in the red box, in order for my processor to execute this line, these numbers are stored in memory. It doesn't work with numbers in memory. It only works with numbers that are in registers. So the first thing it needs to do is actually go and grab A from memory. So this is going to be a load operation. So it's going to get the number one from the memory location where A is and stick it in a register. And in this case, I'm putting it in register one. The next thing it's going to do, it needs to get this uh, number B. So it goes to memory, grabs the two there, and stores that in another register. And finally, it can do this arithmetic operation, the addition, add those two numbers together and store that in another register. It actually could be stored in one of the two we've already used. We're done with those once we get the sum. So, but in this case, I've stored it in register three. And then finally, it needs to go back to C. This is the assignment operation. And so when the memory is transferred, or when the number is transferred from the processor to the memory, that's a store operation. So we're storing B. All right, so the CPU goes through this cycle. And each one of those steps was broken down into really three parts. So if I back up a second, this load operation for the first part would be, uh, first thing it's going to do is fetch the instruction that says I need to load something. So fetch is going to be the first thing that happens. It's going to get an instruction from the memory. That's going to be from the code side of things. Um, then the next thing it's going to do is decode that. It needs to figure out what kind of instruction it is. So I'm going to have instructions that fetch, that store, I'm sorry, that load, that store, that do math. It needs to figure out what kind of instruction we're looking at. And finally, it's going to execute that instruction. So if it's decided it's a load instruction, this is the part where it goes and grabs the number and sticks it into a register. If it's a math operation, that's where it's going to do the, the math and add the two numbers together and then stash that in another register. All right. And this is going to be just repeated in a loop endlessly. So as soon as it's done um, doing the first instruction, and as soon as it's done executing, it's going to go back and fetch the next instruction. It's going to figure out what it's supposed to do by decoding it. It's going to execute that instruction and then go back and get another instruction. It just does this forever. 
<clears throat> okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in this first half of the, the lecture for today is what happens when we actually compile our code, the build process. After we're done writing the code, and I've stored that in a file, uh, sum.c in this case for this program, uh, and then I run the compiler to actually produce my um, machine code, uh, the first thing, that, that's actually, the compiler is a program. It's actually a series of four programs that are run by the CPU that manipulate the code from this file, transform it in a number of steps into my machine code at the other side. So it takes in the source file. The first thing that happens is the preprocessor is going to operate on my source file. This is going to go ahead and remove all the comments that the rest of the compiler doesn't need. If there is any preprocessor um, or compiler directives like to include another file. Um, actually, the preprocessor is kind of its own little programming language, and we'll see a lot of pieces of this throughout the course. Um, but it's going to go through and produce another file, and this typically has the .i extension um, for like intermediate code, and uh, this is also known as the preprocessed source file. Uh, in the next section, uh, the next, like part two of the video, I'm going to go through and break down the build process into each of these four steps and just show you what these uh, files look like after we're done pre-processing them. Okay, so the next thing that happens is the compiler proper. This is given the abbreviation CC1. Um, oh, the abbreviation for the preprocessor CPP stands for C preprocessor. Uh, capital P, capital P right there. Okay. So yeah, the next thing that happens is the compiler proper. This is going to produce uh, code that's actually written in assembly, which is mostly human readable. Uh, I'll be pulling up an example of this when we actually do the demonstration in part two of the video. Um, so uh, the typical extension for this is dot s assembly um, right there. It's the second letter. Um, and this is going to be I'll show you a demonstration uh, in the part two of the video, but this is generally human readable after you've had some experience learning it. It's not, not easy. Okay, the next thing that happens is the assembler will take this sum.s file and generate uh, what's known as an object file, or more specifically, a relocatable object file. And this is going to be machine code at this point. It's going to be in binary, so ones and zeros. But it's not going to be the complete everything we need. If we've included anything from another library, um, the standard library, for example, uh, then we'll still need one final step, the linker, abbreviated LD. Uh, the abbreviation actually comes from the fact that the linker and the loader used to be one component, and so the LD is stuck around as the abbreviation. But this is going to go and grab all of the object files, some.o, or if I've got another uh, I've included something else, uh, like a, something from the standard library. It's going to go get the object code for that and merge them together to finally create the executable. And this is uh, typically without an extension. Uh, no reason you couldn't put one on there, but typically without. And this is going to be binary code that's able to operate and do, uh, you know, pretty much run the entire program. All right, so I'm about to switch over to the demo. This will be the second video down in the list. And I'm actually going to break this down into about three parts. I'm going to do this last one first, the guided learning activity. That way, if you guys are already familiar with how the terminal works and how to use an editor like Vim or Emacs, you can just follow along. Um, I think these will be interesting. Hopefully, you'll learn something, but you'll have the skills already you need to do this. If you're not at all familiar with Linux or navigating using a terminal, uh, this will be a valuable experience. Um, and if you're not familiar with the... Uh, Linux editor Vim or another, you can use any editor you want. If you prefer Emacs, feel free. There's a number of good ones out there. Um, I'm going to use Vim for this class, and so I'm going to do a little demo with all the features and how Vim works. All right, so I will be back for part two.